to the Latin American meeting of the Celestress Society. And to introduce you to the society, we have a very special rate for all of you that want to join the society during this meeting, a very large discount, and you will receive an exchange, a copy of our journal, Sales, Trades, and Chaperone. And at the same time, we encourage all of you to submit papers to this journal that is coming every day better and better. At the same time, let me see if I can read this. No, you, me gustaría de agradecer a Cristina por organizar este maravilloso encuentro. We, we want to thank Cristina for organizing this great workshop, and I hope that you will enjoy the scientific exchange that will occur during this day. Now, Cristina asked me to give a brief talk today, and I decided to use as a topic Okay, I decided to use as a topic this, the controversial field of the Hitchcock problems. When I was on my way here, I was reading this book by Andrew Sorkin called Too to Fail. And he started a book with a friend of Galileo, what I found that was perfect for this society. And say that all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is discover them. And 50 years ago, an Italian scientist, by accident, found that when the cells were switched or put in the wrong incubator, there was a tremendous transcriptional activity. And as a good scientist, he went to check his book and he discovered what was the problem. And he went back and did repeat experiments, do the right controls, and there they discovered the heat of response 50 years ago by ferocious results. So he was very excited, and he tried to publish the paper in a very good journal. And the editor told him that the paper lacked biological importance. <laughs> and after a while, he had to publish in this journal called Experience, which is not in existence anymore. Mm -hmm. And that was the first step of this controversial field. And now, 50 years ago, we're celebrating the, the discovery of the Hitchcock response. Interesting enough, it was 12 years after of his discovery that Alfred T. Sirius identified the gene product of this new transcriptional activity, and he identified the Hitchcock product. Like I see here in this two-dimensional gel. So 14 years have passed, and we know that Hitchcock proteins are there. We know that they are a universal response to stress, and now we know that very well. We know that it's not induced only by heat shock. They can induce by different stresses. And here there is a no comprehensive list of many of these stresses. And also, we know that these proteins participate in the recovery after the insult. A heat of proteins protect cells from subsequent stresses. And in this review of Lynn Susan Lindquist, she showed clearly that if you preheat pre-stressed cells, they become resistant to a second lethal stress. And this is maintaining all kinds of species, what is called stress tolerance. We also know today that heat of proteins are also present during normal conditions and participate in several cellular process, and therefore they have been coined molecular chaperones. And we know that they are coming in different flavors, divided by families of different sizes. <coughs> and during the last years, a lot of work has been done in understanding the biological role of this heat of protein, these chaperones inside the cell. But it was not until 15 years after that this person here, Larry Hightower detect each of proteins outside cells. And that was became a new, new twist in the, in the field of the each of proteins. 
Uh, he published this paper after it took him almost more than a year to convince the reviewers that this was an artifact, that the heat of proteins were outside the cells. And he demonstrated that the expression of the presence of heat of proteins outside cells cannot be blocked by traditional inhibitor of the secretory pathway. But the reviewers didn't believe him, and he took him almost a year to finish publishing the paper. And the paper also uh, resembled parallel studies by Tidal, showing that the exos produce some kind of feature-like protein that also modifies cells. We all know, now, that's what I call Larry, <laughs> the Christophilus Columbus of the extracellular heat shock protein. Because he discovered them, but he didn't realize at that time what he was having in hand. As Larry said, I discovered America where I still thought that I was in India. <laughs> <laughs> but this was forgotten. Many years passed, and it's about 11 years, until the year 2000, uh, Prakashi Bastra wrote, showed that seizure proteins, GRP96 and 70, could activate macrophages. And there the British came, and the Stuart Calderwood, also show that HSP70 could activate macrophages. However, Aldo Stewart published this paper in a very good journal. He was high, heavily criticized by people who was claiming that what he describing was just an artifact, product of contamination with endotoxin, which have been demonstrated very clearly now that it's not the case. However, Stewart, became very famous. He started dressing very nice and always looking for good companies. <laughs> and we today know that heat of proteins, extracellular heat of proteins, are associated with many, many diseases. And here is a list of the current knowledge of diseases that have been detected, heat of proteins in circulation. So the question is, how is this protein being released? And there is two potential mechanisms. One is a passive release from the protein cells. Just by cell damage, broken the cells, the protein, the abundant cytosolic protein is released. Or also from live cells, like Larry suggested, that was confirmed later on by John Williams group. In what these cells, these proteins are, sec are secreted by an unknown mechanism. Now, see, each of protein, especially HSP7, doesn't have a secretory signal, it cannot be secreted through the traditional ER Golgi pathway. Therefore, it should be secreted by the now little known non classical secretory pathway. And it's not the only protein that is secreted through this pathway. The best examples are IL 1, alpha and beta, HMGD1, and other ones. So the question is still. What is this, what is the mechanism of sport of HSP7? And there are three theories. One is that it's released in exosomes. <laughs> the other one is that it's released through a lysosomal dependent pathway. And our own hypothesis has been that it's released after the interaction with the plasma membrane in the form of vesicles. What brings us to another controversial finding. This is Gabriela Multov, who showed in 1995 that HSP70 was present in the surface of cells. But nobody believed her. And she also had a tough time publishing that paper because people say, well, you know, this is a contaminant, the protein is binding to a protein to the cell, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And she had a tough time, nobody believed her. But the matter of fact is that her discovery had been correlated, and this is work from our own lab using an antibody that she prepared. And these are live heat shock HEP2 cells. This is live staining. This is a four degrees, no fixation, no permeabilization. And that's using antibody. You can see clearly the presence of the protein on the cell surface. 
And the interesting thing about this finding is that this protein on the cell surface can only be recognized by the antibody that have been developed, which is to a very small region in the C-terminal of the molecule. Let's say that this is the region that is exposed. And if you try to come out with other antibodies to HSP-70, you don't recognize <coughs> the extracellular form. Well, bring us to another controversial study that was done with my best friend, Nelson Arispe, that in the year 2000, we showed that if you take pure HSP-70 and you put it into a lipid bilayer, you form a tremendous stable ion, ion pathway activity that was stable, uh, uh, exchanged ions, and we published that actually quite fast, so we were rejected by science. And now these have been proven that's the case, that the protein can interact with membranes. So our working hypothesis is that the interaction of HSP-70 with membranes is the first step in the export mechanism. But the question still is how this protein get into membranes. And this is the sequence of HSP-70. And I highlight here all the positive and negative charged amino acids. And you can see there is no conventional wisdom that will tell us which region is the transmembrane region of HSP-70 or how HSP-70 is going to interact with membranes. It's, it, for, this, for this data, it can be developed. Uh, so the question is, how is HSP-70 inserted into membranes? And the saga begins. And that's what I'm going to talk now for some experiments that we're doing in the lab to demonstrate how the protein gets into the membrane. So we, we develop a very simple essay in which we take liposomes and we incubate them with HSP-70 in a very simple solution. We allow them to bind at room temperature. And later on, you spin down the liposomes and you wash them extensively and you analyze the pellet and the supernet. And in the pellet, you will find the liposomes and the supernet and the protein that doesn't bind to the liposomes. And when you do this experiment, here we show that if you take HSP-70 and you incubate it with PS liposomes or totalserine liposomes, there is a nice binding or insertion of HSP-70 in the membranes that doesn't occur with PS, with PC. So that suggests that this is not an artifact, that the protein is not bring down by the mass of the lipids. It's very specific, and that's a negative control we use HSP-70. And you can see clearly that HSP-90, HSP I'm sorry, doesn't interact with lipids. Now happy with that, we took these liposomes and we subject them to various estrogen washes. After the liposomes were pellet, we washed them extensively at pH 11 or pH 2. And still in these very dramatic conditions, the protein remains associated with the liposome, suggesting that it's actually inserted. And as a matter of fact, if we use sonicate the, pro the liposomes, you don't release HSP-70, now indicating that it's not in the lumen of the liposome, that it has to be integral part of the membrane. We have repeated the process. Uh, amazingly enough, the process is very, very rapid. We initially were doing 30 minutes incubation, but just five minutes incubation, you get exactly the same incorporation that you have. And surprisingly enough, it gets incorporated into the liposomes even at four degrees. So it's a very fast and stable interaction. So then, we decide to use other lipids to see what is the specificity of the protein? And we found that beside PS is also bind PG. And PG is also a negative charge amino acid. So it really recognizes negative charge lipids. The interaction with PG is almost nothing and nothing ever with PC. We also did mixtures of uh, lipids. And that's a very, very interesting experiment. So you go, you start with 100% PS, and you start increasing the amount, decreasing the amount of PS and increasing the amount of 